Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Cal here with you every Monday and Thursday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well. The NHL on ESPN YouTube. We have New York Post writer Molly Walker who will be joining us to talk all things New York Rangers. We will dive deep into the spectacular games that happened on Wednesday night in the postseason as well uh, with the Florida Panthers and the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, winning in the ways that they did. Uh, lots to unpack there. But first, what does this mean for the Toronto Maple Leafs? <laughs> As if there wasn't enough happening in in uh, the hockey world wish, the Leafs have to interject themselves in every which way. Uh, on a serious note, of course, um, Sheldon Keefe, relieved of his duties, no longer head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs after five seasons. This is the quote from general manager Brad Tree Living. Quote, today's decision was difficult. Sheldon is an oh, excellent yeah. coach and a great man. However, we so hard. determined... A yeah. new voice is needed to help the team push through to reach our ultimate goal. Immediate reaction, wish. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure Brad for Living really locked himself in a dungeon for a week to really dwell on whether or not to uh, fire the coach he never hired. Such a hard <laughs> decision to figure out if you should get rid of the guy that only won one playoff series during his tenure there and and couldn't get them over the hump in a game seven against Boston. Um, this was inevitable. But the only way Sheldon Keefe was going to keep his job was if the Toronto Maple Leafs probably won two playoff rounds. Um, he's not true living's guy. The fact that he's Dubas's guy might prevent him from getting another NHL job, if we're being honest. And here's the irony of it, though, Arda. Like, if you ask around the league, he did more coaching in this series against Boston than maybe he ever has. Now, whether you liked it or you didn't, and in our friend Dom Lasinski's case on uh, on The Athletic, he didn't because he was, wrote a big thing about how the Leafs tactically were a mess for, under Keefe's tenure. Mm -hmm. um, like, he at least tried to do something after Matthews couldn't go to keep them in the series. I think it was successful. And it's just kind of ironic that he, he gets the gate after what might have been his best piece of coaching during his tenure in Toronto. But again, not true living's guy. Inevitable this was going to happen. And, uh, and uh, you know, quite the difficult decision, I'm sure, for the Leafs. I, I think a lot of Leaf fans would say it should have happened sooner. Um, I think that uh, a very long rope for, um, for Sheldon Keefe and his tenure with the Leafs. And you say that purely based on results. The, the thing is, if you look at this season, Wish, this series could have been palatable for a Leafs fan if not for all of the past recent results. Mm -hmm. This was yeah. actually a very well-played series by the yeah. Leafs. It came down to one goal in overtime, and they played game five and game six, which you could argue were two of the best playoff games that the Leafs have played in 20 years. Yeah. In the back of your mind, you're like, are they going to fire him? Because <laughs> like, because it was it was that 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 notion of like, oh my god, you know, they finally played the way we wanted to see them play, and and look at the the doggedness of Nylander and Matthews coming mm -hmm. back from from these ailments to to try to tough it out. Like there was that sense of we can be satisfied with the effort after this series, but again, you can't be satisfied with the results, and and there he goes. So, um, not a so, huge surprise, I, I don't think. Now, now the question is, Arda. Where do they turn next? So, what do you so think they look at? This is what I wanted to present to you. So right now, there have been a total of 19 coaching changes since the, the end of last season in the NHL. 63 and a third percent of the teams in the NHL have seen coaching changes. So that all that to say, whether it's experienced coaches, whether it's coaches waiting in the wings, there is no shortage of candidates that the Leafs could look at. Let me ask you this. What style of coach, what experience level coach do you think the Leafs need as their next coach? Well, speaking of candidates, I've got something on ESPN.com this morning, in fact, uh, that deals okay. with all of the coaching candidates. A gigantic, uh, you know, it's 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 like the, uh, the Mariana Trench right now, as far as the depth of coaching <laughs> that we have in this uh, in, in, in the in the league, not only in the NHL, but also outside the NHL. Like I chronicle a lot of the out of the box choices, college choices, that kind of thing. So there's two names I want to throw at you. Okay. One could happen. One maybe couldn't. The one that could happen is Craig Rube. And, and, and I think the thing that Rube brings to Toronto is a big, bright, shiny Stanley Cup ring, which you probably want if you're going to hire a new coach, is someone that's won before and can stand in front of a room of guys that haven't and say, here's how you do it. 
But his real talent is not tactical. He's not his X's and O's is basically like let's bludgeon them on a four, on the four check. His talent is keeping a team focused through adversity. I covered that series that that playoff run for the St. Louis Blues. They dealt with a lot of stuff. A lot of weird stuff in those games. And the thing that Craig Ruby was able to do was keep them laser focused on the task at hand, shut out the outside noise, and really did a great job psychologically keeping the Blues on track. To have that in Toronto, I mean, granted, I don't know, I don't know if Freud <laughs> could handle the psychological powers in pl at play in Toronto with this team, but but I think Ruby could do a good job in 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 applying his talents to that situation. Now, the guy they might not get is Quenville. And let's be honest, that's the guy. That's the guy for a lot of these teams. Now, I'm on the record as saying I don't want to see Joel Quenville coach in this league again. But I was talking to an NHL source last night about Quenville, and they said if a team comes a knocking on Gary Bettman's door, and especially a team like the Toronto Maple Leafs, mm -hmm. and says that we would like to hire Joel Quenville, the source told me they would not be surprised in the least if Joel Quenville coached next season in the National Hockey League. Now, again, that's not something I want to see and not something a lot of people want to see. And in fact, it still is baffling to me that there could be active litigation against the Chicago Blackhawks over those sexual assault scandal back in 2010 mm -hmm. and have Quenville, you know, back in this league while that's still ongoing. Um, but I think there's this perception right now based on, you know, him doing two big media interviews in the last uh, several months uh, and the fact there's been, you know, some distance between when he left the Florida Panthers to now um, that if somebody came asking that there's a chance that maybe better than in previous seasons that Joel Quenville could coach again. And would that team be Toronto? I think for that coaching position, now remember, Sheldon Keefe won a Calder Cup with the Marlies, became the Leafs head coach, had five seasons. To me, it feels like an experienced coach in general would yeah. be the play. Like a lot of there, there's a lot of waiting in the wings coaches, for example, like a David Carl in Denver that could absolutely become an NHL coach. Yeah. In this particular case, though, doesn't it feel to you like an experienced coach? All the points that you made about Barube, it feels like an experienced coach with lots of years. You know, it would have been great is, is, is like a Rick Bonus type. He's not coming out of retirement for this job. I'm just saying like someone with that kind of experience. Well, I mean, Bo and Bonus did great in the sense of like he got into a situation that was toxic and then figured out what the toxicity was and fixed it and, and made the team play better. Um, I, I think they need. Wait, you mean he's can... good at that kind of situation? Huh? Where else does that exist? I yeah, know. Right? Wait a minute. Well, the Fish. man's retired. The man's retired. I mean, the, honestly, <laughs> I was talking to somebody this morning and they made the point that the, the perfect guy for the job is unfortunately the general manager of the National Predators at this point. Um, yeah, yeah, right. The guy for the job. Right. Um, you know, th I agree. I think it's going to be experienced. There are some good young coaches, uh, you know, that people are going to look at. I don't think David Carl is leaving Denver necessarily uh, in the NCAA to come coach in the NHL right, right now. But Ryan Warsofsky, uh from the San Jose Sharks is, is going to be your Spencer Carberry at this point. I think he's a, a young assistant that a lot of people have their eyes on as being a potential head coach. He has AHL experience he's, he, and success. So that's the name you should watch as far as like the, the hotshot assistants. Oh, and by the way, Maybe they should have just fired Keith last year and promoted Carberry. Maybe that would have been the smart decision. But Maybe. Uh, if if okay. and buts were candy and nuts, you know what they say. I don't know the one, end of that saying. How do one they, more how do they even end that saying. I'm not even sure. Um, one more name. Yeah, for you. I would agree. Experience in Toronto is probably where they go. One more name for you. Total long shot. Can't even happen at the moment. But friend of the drop, John Cooper. Well, John Cooper is the best coach in the NHL. Full stop. So, like, if you were able to figure out a way to get John Cooper to Toronto, that'd be great. Uh, John Cooper is the kind of guy that would take on that challenge, I think, in trying to bring a cup that, to that's Toronto. How, the that's why I brought it up. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, but, I, I think he would relish in that, and I think that he would actually thrive in the Toronto media market. But I also think John Cooper has a beautiful backyard where he can post up and smoke a cigar under the the Florida sunshine <laughs> whenever he wants to. So he's and, like, uh, I'm good, I'm good. I mean, I that that might be the ultimate, the ultimate, his stuff is there. Uh, for John Cooper. Fair enough. Uh, well, we will monitor the uh, the coaching carousel uh, that's never been larger in the NHL. Uh, again, 19 coaching changes since the end of last season. Uh, now the latest being Sheldon Keefe in the Toronto Maple Leafs. Let's talk about the games on Wednesday. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Talk about an exciting night, uh, an exciting doubleheader in the NHL. Uh, let's begin with Boston and Florida. 
Uh, it was WrestleMania, man. <laughs> Holy cow. That third period was intense. Uh, can I can I just start with like, OK, first of all, yes, the Florida Panthers get their revenge statement victory after getting blown out in game one. They blow out the Bruins in game two. Can I start with the David Pasternak and and and, and Matthew Kachuk? Please do. To me, it looked like and, and I get it. Jim Montgomery said after the game that he did not have a conversation or I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially he, said he, didn't, he didn't green light him. To he didn't fight, green light David Pasternak. Which is true because Pasternak just turned around and said, I'm going to fight this guy. And, 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 and Montgomery was like, thanks, okay. for the, thanks for the update. Thanks for the update. All right, <laughs> fine. Fair enough. So we're, we're, we're going with that route. Sure. But the way that this on the, the whole period unfolded was a complete so, entertainment. Well, let's, let's talk about the fight. So <clears throat> the fight's special for a few reasons. Um, First of all, it, it is probably the first staged fight that we've seen in the National Hockey League in which the majority of fans signed off and approved of it. I mean, <laughs> last night was like you a lot of people were like caveating their love for the fight by saying, I don't want to sound like a Neanderthal, but 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 everybody's like, this is awesome. Like, like we got no problem with this. It's fun as hell to watch these guys punch each other, uh, considering it's it's Pasternak and, and, and Kachuk. The second thing is what a beautiful reality show moment last night. Be, you know, we've watched all these NHL reality shows, Road to the Winter Classic, Road to the Stanley Cup, whatever. Rare is the moment that we got last night where we see uh, Pasternak and Kachuk talk to each other by the penalty boxes, go back to their respective benches. They're still yelling, yelling at each other. It's all on camera. We actually see Pasternak go to Montgomery to let him know what's up. And then they have the fight. Like, what an incredible beat by beat sort of timeline of how a fight like that comes together. And then finally, Arda, the playoffs are about distraction sometimes. Remember what way back in the day when Chris Pronger was stealing the pucks out of nets and pissing off the other team by doing so? That was designed so no one would talk about the problems the Flyers were having in that series against Chicago. That fight last night for Pasternak is a moment in which, A, he rallies the boys if you're willing to make that sacrifice with your body, knowing who you are, then damn it, we will too. But it also is a moment in which on the day after a blowout loss that evens the series, not a soul is talking about Jeremy Swayman. And that's why you do the fight. Yeah, and and you're absolutely right. The only person that's talking about Jeremy Swayman is Jim Montgomery talking to him after he pulled him essentially to say, hey, this isn't on you or whatever he said there before Swayman went uh, through the tunnel, who who starts Game Three for Boston? You go, you go, Olmark. Give give really Swayman a, give Swayman a breather. Uh huh. Okay. If Olmark loses, you run Swayman back in Game Four. He's rested. You, he comes out of the bullpen ready to go, ready to save the day. Give the man a mental break. And and worst worst case scenario, Arda, Olmark plays great, and now you can go back to like a goalie rotation if you want to. Um, you know, or maybe that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that he loses and then Swayman comes back to save the day in game four. I just think you need to give him a, a, a breather. He's played a lot of hockey in the last couple of weeks in really big, intense, mentally draining situations. Um, there's no harm in, in coming back with all Mark in game three. Studio was all about Swayman in game three. And I agree with you, actually. I think it should be all Mark because we quickly forget that these two goalies traded the net back and forth, game for game for game, the last like 30 games of the regular season for the Bruins. And yes, Swayman has had a well, great hot streak, but that's studio, their norm. Like, like, like Weeksy was in the studio last night, and, he's, and his, his contention is probably like, you can't give away the crease. Like he's thinking about it as a goalie, and, and I completely understand that. But like from a tactical perspective, from an emotional perspective, from a psychological perspective, it makes all the sense in the world to give Swayman a break, play the other guy, and then if you need him, then, then Swayman comes back and plays hero because you don't want to go the other way. You don't want Swayman to play game three, gets, you know, gassed for four goals in two periods. And now, and now you might lose them. You know what I mean? Give him a break. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's, it's the smart thing to do if I'm, I'm from Jim Montgomery. The, the Panthers had 67 penalty minutes in the third period, most in a single period in franchise playoff history. The Bruins had 87, or sorry, 79 penalty minutes in the third alone, 87 total, but that's 79 third most in any period in Bruins franchise history. Uh, how about Brandon Montour taunting Brad Marchand with the, uh, with the lick? <laughs> with Listen, the tongue. You, if you he know that's going to, yeah, if you know, if, if you like, that's going to come back to you, man. Like, and you know what? Good on Brandon Montour for picking the right time to do it.
That was really awesome. And and again, just, you know, ups the ante. It's great to see people throwing Marshan's jokes back at him. But the other <laughs> thing about Marshan, Marshan the other the, last night uh, in that game, man, he had, a, he had a hit on Reinhardt that was just like, Reinhardt was very lucky to not get hit. I, and I heard tangentially, uh, get injured rather, I heard tangentially that the Panthers were kind of upset about it. It was kind of like a weird wig, leg whip almost on Reinhardt. Oh, okay. And uh, you don't like seeing that. But uh, now, uh, as we do he the show, I had a show, great hit on Kachuk too. That, yeah, I haven't heard Kachuk any, was like, trying to do the between things oh, happening okay. there yet, but yeah. uh, it was not a not a good look for for Marchand. But clean hit though. Marchand had a terrific hit on uh, Matthew Kachuk when Kachuk was trying to do the between the legs to get by him. Yeah, Marchand was, awesome. was like, "Nope, that ain't happening on my watch." Boom. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the Florida Panthers even the series, big win in Game Two. Series shifts to Boston for Game Three. Meanwhile, another three goal comeback wish. We had one yesterday with the Avalanche. Uh, down three nothing in the first period, they come back to win the game four three. And meanwhile, the Oilers were up three against the Vancouver Canucks in game one, and Vancouver storms back. They score three goals in five minutes and end up winning the game. Uh, no shots for Connor McDavid. Wish first time that that's ever happened in the playoffs. Are the Oilers okay? So here, here's the thing about McDavid that's interesting. So that is the first time he didn't have a shot on goal. There were two other times in this postseason where he almost did that. He only had one shot on goal against the Kings on April 28th and one shot on goal against the Kings in an overtime loss on uh, April 24th. So there's he's only had one shot on goal, uh, or I should say less than two shots on goal, four times in his career, and it's happened three times in this postseason. So a little concerning, I think, for Connor. Uh, as far as like that, that goes, but, uh, are they okay? I gotta be honest with you. I think they are. And not just cause I picked them to win the cup part. I think they're okay <laughs> because I did not think that the Edmonton Oilers were going to walk into that, that environment in a game one in Vancouver and come away with a victory. Now I, I did, didn't think they'd lose like that. I didn't think they'd, they'd kind of repeat the feat of what the Dallas stars did and blow up lead like that. Um, but I did think they might need a game to get their skates under them to understand the different dynamic here. We're going against this Vancouver team on the road, much different than playing a Kings team that you know how to beat no matter where you're playing. And so I, I felt like they needed a game of adjustment. Now, now they understand the tempo. Now they understand what's going on. And uh, and hopefully you can play a better game too, especially if you're... I mean, I can't put the whole thing on Skinner, but Skinner could have been better in that game. Okay, so let's talk about that because Stuart Skinner had a great series against the Kings. That one nothing game was a spotlight game for him. Mm. This game, there were a couple of goals where you were like, ah, maybe Stuart Skinner could have had that. Yeah, yeah. yeah sort of. So where's your confidence level on Skinner for the rest of the series? It's fine. Like, he's never okay. going to win them a game. Like, I, I even that one nothing Kings win uh, was more team defense than anything else. You just don't want him to lose the series. And I felt his performance in game one was much more lose the series. Um, he'll be fine. He has the ability to bounce back. He's 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 proven himself to be a, a strong, uh, mentally strong goaltender in the playoffs. Um, the bigger the bigger concern for me is um, not completely putting the game away when you had a chance. And that's more of a team thing than a Skinner thing. OK, uh, quickly on Dallas, because they also suffered a three goal comeback. Are they OK? <laughs> yeah, they'll, they're fine too. Uh, that's a life lesson in game one. Um, don't blow a three, nothing lead to the avalanche at home, <laughs> but you have to remember again, you know, as much as this puts them behind the eight ball in game two, and as much as they have expended a lot more energy in these playoffs than have the Colorado avalanche so far, which is kind of the biggest concern right now, if you're the stars, um, they also are a team that's coming off a series in which they dropped the first two at home. So even if they lose game two, I don't think they're going to be like packing up the tents. But okay. I got to tell you, Arda, the happiest man alive right now after game one of that series between Dallas and Colorado, Connor Hellebuck. He's pointing at the camera like the DiCaprio meme. He's like, look at that. Ottinger's got an eight something save percentage in game one. And they all thought it was me. And look at it. It's actually Colorado that does that to great goalies. Also, happiness exists right now in New York City around Madison Square Garden. Not just for the Knicks, by the way, who are also doing great. But for the Rangers, as they are up 2-0, took both games at home. Could they win the Stanley Cup? They very well could win the Stanley Cup. And we dive into that and more with Molly Walker. Happy to have joining us here on The Drop, New York Post, New York Rangers reporter Molly Walker, who was at Madison Square Garden watching the New York Rangers win in double overtime 
against the Carolina Hurricanes, taking a 2-0 series lead against the Canes. Uh, Molly, what was your what was your biggest takeaway from the Rangers in the win in Game 2? Uh, that the Hurricanes came full throttle and the Rangers still prevailed. Mm. That, I mean, Game 2 was quintessential Carolina Hurricanes. Very, very much so outplayed the Rangers in, in most aspects of the game, aside from specialty teams. Uh, but the Rangers overcame two deficits, stuck with it, and Vincent Trocek with the dagger in overtime to send his former team back to Raleigh in a 2 nothing series hole. So you really can't script it any better than that for the Rangers. But, I mean, this is just a team that is so dialed in right now i mean they're six and zero in the playoffs and that's kind of all you need to know <laughs> molly you're you cover the rangers but you are a a free thinking and independent <laughs> Thank <hockey you>. journalist <laughs> what did you make of the carolina hurricanes accusations after game two that the rangers keep falling down to draw penalties they're not wrong you know, they're, <laughs> they're they're not wrong but you know what it's this is sports this is entertainment you know when the rangers power play is operating at the level that it is i'd be diving too you know it's it's part of the game obviously it's not you know it's not great and i do think that the rangers should be careful about it especially adam fox i mean igor shesterkin um that was an all-time academy award-winning performance by igor shesterkin but uh, again svechnikov should not have made contact and there was zero attempt to avoid contact so you can't really blame Igor for for selling it either but you know it's definitely something to be conscientious about um but you know that's that's sports baby <laughs> it sure is I agree with you 100 sports is entertainment and Igor Shosturkin won a lot of hardware in game two actually aside mm -hmm. from what you just mentioned 54 saves Ugh. is that the Rangers record for most saves in a playoff game and a win Mm -hmm. uh, he already had the record for most saves period in a game. But how much of the Rangers' success is solely on the shoulders of Shesterkin so far? Listen, I, I, I the, the Igor has been been pretty great. Um, but I think that the star players have showed up in force for the Rangers. And I wrote a column about it. I mean, what we're witnessing, what we've witnessed the whole season, honestly, is indirect response to the embarrassment that I think that they felt at the end of last season, just the way that it went down, the high expectations that they had for themselves. It's fueled them all season long. And I think that it was incredibly evident in how receptive they were to Peter Laviolette and the habits that he has instilled upon them and the way that he's challenged them to play and compete and practice all season long. Um, the buy-in was immediate and I just think that they are so dialed in. Like I've said, I just feel like they have been tunnel vision in terms of what they know they want to accomplish, but at the same time, really embracing the game to game grind and, you know, making adjustments on a game to game basis and just priding themselves on being the best, um, and competing like it. So as much as as Igor has been great for them, he is a star. And and that's that's just part of the equation of all of them showing up in force in this playoff run here. And it has resulted in an unbeaten streak. Yeah, they they're unbeaten. You know, they've gone six and oh in the in the first six games. And and you know, that is so difficult to do at this time of year, especially when you play, face a Hurricanes team that funneled 57 shots on goal <laughs> last night. I mean, and for them to come out on the other side, still 6-0, and oh, it's just, it's impressive. It really is. Everybody check out Molly's column. Uh, it's insightful. And the other thing, I mean, you know, it's kind of reminds me of like when the, the Lightning had to get their behinds handed to them by the Blue Jackets, right? Before mm -hmm. they became really receptive to yeah. what John Cooper's trying to preach. Hey, you got to play a certain way in the playoffs to win. Like it, it took them to be totally humbled and humiliated yes. as the Rangers were in, 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 you know, allowing the Devils to rally in that series to really become receptive to, to change. Um, you, I wanted to ask you kind of a New York sports question. You, you work at sure. the Post. Yeah. You know what the dynamics are in the media. 
the way the Knicks and the Rangers yeah. are both in the playoffs right now. I mean, first of all, echoes of '94. Let's get. Oh that my out god! Of the way. Oh my god! Though, but, but I mean, but oh my god! Though, you know, what, what's it like in in sort of like the newsroom <laughs> aspect of having both these teams be as good as they are at the same time, and 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 energizing the city in very different ways. Man, papers are flying off the shelves. That's <laughs> that's that's all that matters. Good isn't for business. It? Um, yeah, it's really good for business. Um, but first of all, the 94 correlations and parallels are getting way out of hand for me. I just can't even I can't even acknowledge it anymore. I can't even keep track of it anymore. It's freaking me out. So that's one thing. But yeah, I mean, the city is electric right now. Everywhere you go, everybody's wearing Rangers and Knicks gear. Everybody's Island into sports bars all over the city and watching games. I mean, my roommates who are not sports fans at all are at bars in the city with groups of people. Everybody is watching these games and it's it's a feeling throughout the city and it's and it's a city that has been starved of a championship for quite some time now. So everybody's itching. Everybody's itching for one of these two teams to do it and uh, things are looking good as of right now. I, I get to watch the games in studio with Mark Messier. So 94 <laughs> Rangers is always top of mind. Of course. Uh, yeah. And and the 94 Rangers went 7-0 and to start their postseason uh, back in 94. So they're, they're another, let's add to the correlation, shall Seriously, we? Seriously. Um, no, it's yeah. been crazy. It's been, yeah. it's been, it's been a little yeah. out of hand. <laughs> um, Molly, I have a couple uh, Rangers specific questions. Uh, when I mentioned to some people on campus uh, that you were coming onto the show, uh, some very passionate Rangers fans had some very specific questions. Sure. Uh, so uh, Philip Heedle and Blake Wheeler, mm -hmm. uh, what's the status update on them? Yeah, well, Philip Heedle has been a full participant since the playoffs began. Um, he's out there every day, uh, morning skates, uh, extra skates. He's 100% back. He's been medically, medically cleared. Um, but at this point, the Rangers are 6-0. and they're they're not they're not sitting anybody right now. They're mm -hmm. not making any adjustments, any lineup changes. Why would they? Um, who are you looking in the face and saying we're sitting you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you know. So he he's available, but I, I think that in you know obviously everybody's been talking about how hard the Rangers practice, but even when I watch them do gassers it's very evident that he has not seen game action in six months. So I think that that is a factor here and something that everybody's aware of. And I look at him as a break glass in case of emergency kind of situation um, where he could be used as a rallying cry type of deal and throwing him into the lineup. But until that situation presents itself, I don't see it happening um Blake Wheeler just skated with the team for the first time actually he's in a red non-contact jersey I Peter Laviolette kind of left it open-ended but he also has said that he's not commenting on any sort of personnel or lineup uh details since the playoffs began but I don't see Wheeler as an option for the Rangers uh in this postseason run so let me let me just follow up wish really quick uh, a lot of people are pointing to Matt Rempe. Yeah. Obviously, speaking of rallying cry, Rempire State <laughs> Building can't get no bigger than Matt Rempe. No, nope. uh, but but limited minutes. Uh, and and I guess at this point, at some point, we're going to turn to his play on the ice as opposed to just him being a you know a giant imposing body. So, what have you made of his play on the ice and? his contributions to the team on the ice for the Rangers. When you look especially at game two and the fact that Matt Rempe didn't see the ice in the third period or any of the overtimes, that's a situation where as Peter Laviolette, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, maybe is this the best course of action for me to take? It's you're, you're willingly shortening your bench that being said, in his limited minutes, he does have an impact. He has an impact on the atmosphere more than anything else. Um, and that is something that is that is palpable. It's tangible. It's it's infectious. Um, 
And I do think that he can play. I definitely do. Um, it's a slippery slope with how much attention he garners from the refs. Kelly Sunder Sunderland, Sutherland swagging his finger in his face <laughs> after after getting shoved to the ice by Drury after he purposely skated toe to toe with him without touch it toe to toe with Freddie Anderson without touching him after Svechnikov barreled over Igor Shosturkin a little dramatically on the other end you know but that's I don't know that's gamemanship that's that's just all part of it it's part of this game um and I do think that he has an effect he does but you know there's so many different factors and and things to take into consideration that surround him he's a He's a polarizing guy. He really, really is. But um, you ask anybody in that room and they want him out there. You know, yeah. they they want him. They want him on the ice. They do. All right. Last one for me. Is the team going to win the cup? Like, you know what's in the West and you know what's going on in the East and you know how good they're playing. And you've covered them for a long time. And and this is clearly the the best we've seen of this of this franchise in recent years. Are the New York Rangers going to win the Stanley Cup, Bolly Walker? They very well could. There is no reason to believe that they won't at this point in time, especially, obviously. Um, I think that this season in general felt really wide open. And I think that the Rangers have been the most consistent team in the league the entire season. And that has not wavered, not once, since the playoffs began. So like I said about the Stars, and like I said in my column, they are going to be a really, really tough team to beat if all of them keep showing up in force the way that they have. I mean, it's not just a couple of guys. It is the entire it is the core of star players that they've had. They are producing. They are making an impact on a game to game basis. They're coming up with clutch goals. It's it's 100 percent within reach. For this Rangers team, it 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 really is. There's no reason why it shouldn't be, e even though everybody wants to call them an underdog in this series and and <laughs> wants to and wants to say that you know the odds are in the Hurricanes' favor. I, mean, I just I don't even get me started. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I was, I'm not I was shocked. It. I was shocked when the sports books made them an underdog. Like I, after watching them against the Capitals and. Uh, watching Carolina uh, against the Islanders, I'm like, you guys Greg, are missing the boat on this range. No, team. Greg, I went, I actually, we do this thing on, on up in the blue seats. We, Brian Boyle does a boiling point in the boiler room where he, you know, sounds <laughs> off on, on something he's pissed off about. <laughs> and I said, let me take it off your hands this week because I have, <laughs> I have something to say. And I started off by prefacing it with, you know, as, as a, as a beat writer and as someone who, went to school for journalism. I got my degree in sports journalism. I sat through two hour ethics courses every Thursday. I was taught, it was beat into me, you know, not to be a homer. You know, you, you don't cheer in the press box, never be a homer. I vote on the awards every year and I am super conscious of not looking like a Rangers beat writer just because that's how it's always been beat into me. But you know what? When the team that you're covering has the season that the Rangers are having, you have to give credit where credit is due. You yeah. have to make, you have, like, it is also my duty to do that as well. And I think the Rangers have been so disrespected this season. I, I really, really do. I really do. No Jack Adams award finalist for, for Peter Laviolette. No Hart Trophy finalist for Artemi Panarin. And look, the Hart Trophy race is a, one of the deepest we've seen this season. But I, I really, I just think that they have not been given the credit that they've deserved. And for Vegas to to say that 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 it's as lopsided as as they did was quite frankly disrespectful. It, it, it was, it, it just was. And I, I think that the Rangers have have proven that. <laughs> fuel to the fire, fuel to the fire. Uh, Molly Walker, New York Post. Uh, New York Rangers reporter. Uh, check out our podcast, read her stuff on the New York Post as well. Uh, always great work. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us here on The Drop. Thanks so much. Thanks to Molly Walker for joining The Drop. And hey, 
Utah news. Utah owner Ryan Smith has released a survey through Qualtrics, his big old company, uh, <laughs> to allow fans to vote on what his NHL team's new name will be. First, some news. Utah's NHL franchise will have jerseys that display the name Utah on them during their inaugural season, 2024-25. Once the team name has been selected by the fans, then the uh, Smith Entertainment Group will work diligently to craft the team identity, logo, mascot, colors, and other branding elements for the 25-26 season. So sounds like we're getting a team name for next season, uh, next season, Arda. And I've been told that at the NHL draft, rather than having the Mark Shifley NHL Shield jersey, uh, they will have a jersey that says Utah. And I can tell you with some informed speculation that if you look at the logo they used at the NHL draft, with a slight little blue tint to it, mm -hmm. that blue tint may uh, end up on these jerseys, but we shall see. Uh, but uh, now we have the names, Arda. Yes, uh, a good sleuthing there on the color. Uh, I will remind everybody that we did our own vote uh, for the Utah names, the ones that were speculated uh, based on you know rumors and reports out there. And Yeti, which is on this list, did huh. win out. So oh, ho hold on. Or Yetis. I, must, I have to stop you there. Yeah. We said Yetis because the plural of Yeti is Yetis, mm -hmm. but the word on the list is Yeti. So they have decided that they are not going grammatically correct, which probably is the right idea because it sounds better. Mm. Plural of Yeti is Yetis. Let's just be honest. I just, I, I also feel like whether it was Yeti or Yetis on our, our poll, it would have won. <laughs> whatever singular plural doesn't matter anyway those are the utah names so the survey is out i think you pick four of them from the so list yeah real submit. quick black diamonds blast blizzard canyons caribou frost freeze fury glaciers hive ice mammoth mountaineers ugh, Ute, uh, outlaws powder buddy you are asking for a world of trouble no, that ends up being powder strike powder uh, from the list squall swarm which was one that i i lobbied for on espn daily recently Venom, Yete, and Utah HC. So four choices from the fans, and then we'll see what how it all shakes out. I'm guessing I'm gonna guess it's probably Yeti at the end of the day. Yeah, Yeti will win. Uh, by the way, go listen to that ESPN Daily. Uh, you did a great job recapping everything Arizona with the article you wrote with Emily, and Thanks. then uh, also the uh, the whole Utah thing with our boy Clinton Yates, uh, yeah. who hosts ESPN ESPN Daily now. Um, okay, I want to do an AMA with you. Uh, so you were one of the quality control participants. You were there surveying, watching, overseeing everything at the NHL draft lottery. Uh, so you were in Secaucus at NHL Network Studios while this was occurring. Yes, that's, uh, that's exactly right. They, uh, they, it was very nice of uh, John Delapina from the NHL. Shout out to John for okay. uh, inviting me to be one of the three media observers of the draft lottery, fully knowing if Wyshynski says we're on the up and up, then people will probably believe that That's we're right. on the up and up because we know that man will be looking for any glitch, any inkling of conspiracy happening inside that windowless room. How, how much are you allowed to talk about this? I could talk about everything. Everything. Okay, cool. So I, I didn't actually prepare any questions. I just want to like have a free flowing conversation about this because I'm genuinely curious. When did you get there? Uh, Five o'clock on uh, the day of the draft lottery. 5 p.m. Okay. So what... Like, what did they tell, like, upon arrival, like, what did they tell you? Where did you go? Well, it was, it was at the, it was at the MLB network studios where they do NHL network. Yep. And it was basically just like, here's a small room with the lottery machine and the odds on a video screen. You had to uh, put your laptop over in the corner. You had to put your phone in an envelope, like you're at the comedy cellar and, okay. uh, and then just sit there and, and take notes with a pen and paper. Uh, there were sandwiches. I mean, bribery is. Oh, you got catering. Okay. okay. Yeah, they got catering. Nice. And, nice. Uh, and snickerdoodle cookies. And then we uh, at around uh, 530 ish, I'd say, is when we all moved over into the room. And uh, and the commissioner gave a lengthy description of the rules um, about the lottery before uh, also providing proof of life by holding up that day's Wall Street Journal and New York Times, <laughs> as well as his phone to let us know exactly what time it yep. was. And it was 538 when the lottery began. Okay, 5.38 p.m. Okay, because the actual broadcast was at 6.30, right? Yep. So it was about an hour before. Okay, mm -hmm. so most of that was taped then. Well, I, 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 the TV thing wasn't anything I was privy to because we were. We oh, were you weren't in, in the same basically. room. Oh, this was a different room, it's right? So you were in the room. room. They're on. They're on stage. The, the lottery okay. is happening in a different part okay. of the building. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Okay, so how did the process work? 
I mean, he's never seen the lottery. <laughs> no, but like, like, seen. like, isn't there? Is it? Is it? It like, like, there's like a all the permutations get assigned based on percentage they, or something the like teams, that. The teams, the uh, teams get uh, there's for whatever percentage they have chance of getting the first overall pick is how many uh, random number combinations they're allotted, and then they put I think it's like thirteen balls or fourteen balls in the machine. They pull one every twenty seconds. And that becomes the number sequence that is then matched to a number sequence on a very long uh, collection of papers that you receive. And you can see which team uh, won the lottery based on that. So it's okay, not so, like logo okay. balls in a machine or anything. It's no. just random sequence of numbers. The team has that random sequence and they win the first pick. They, they win. Okay. So you, so because you were in that room, did you know anything of what was going on? Like how uh, there was all this hoopla on social media about it being spoiled and the graphics on screen. Did yeah. you see any of that? I, I found out about it when I got there and, and someone said, uh, I don't know why we're here because Bucci already spoiled it. I'm just like, what do you mean? Cause I hadn't seen anything. I'd been traveling most of the day. So uh, yeah, I, I, I saw that. I heard about it after I got there. It's pretty funny. Okay, so it, it, it reminded me of when you're at a game and you take a picture of them like maintaining the ice in the afternoon, and then there's like a fake score on the jumbotron, and then yes, people freak out. Yes. They're like, "Oh, well, obviously the Rangers are going to win three two tonight," kind of thing. Okay, how many of you were in the room? There's 19 people in the room. So 19 of you. Okay, so and how many people were invited, like you, to be quality control? You mean guys from Jersey? There's probably like five. <laughs> oh, you mean the media? Three, yeah. three media people. Who were the other two? It was Shang Peng from San Jose and uh -huh. Mike Morale from NHL.com. Oh, nice. Okay. So so then the balls get selected. Who who does the actual like administering of the like the I press the button, the machine works and the balls come up? There's a machine tech there, the guy that actually like man maintains the machine and puts it together and, and then takes it apart after it's done. And he's there with a control panel and he presses a green button uh every time it's time to uh or maybe a red button. Uh, every time it's time to stop the machine, every 20 seconds, he presses a button, which led to a very funny situation later on in the lottery when, for those who don't know, the Sharks won the first drawing for the first overall pick. Then they draw a second time for the second overall pick. The Sharks won that twice, which then led to Gary Bettman being like, well, we've never had one redraw, let alone two. And he turned to the guy with the control panel. He goes, I hope your finger isn't getting tired. I'm like, that is a classic Gary Bettman joke. Love it. <laughs> Wasn't it four times? Didn't the Sharks win four four different? People keep that saying that. No, yeah, they no, won the first didn't lottery. They won okay. the next two lotteries, and then Chicago won the lottery. I don't know where that came from. That they won four times. Okay, okay. So, all right, cool. That's a that's a cool process. So, what happened afterwards? You just went ate, ate a sandwich and went home. No, man. We talked to Macklin Celebrini after that. Oh, right, right, right. You, yeah, he you was had there on because he was in studio. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. a chance to ask him. The only thing I wanted to ask him, which is that, did you get advice about how to act on the air? And he said that he, he did have he, like he didn't go back and look at YouTube clips, but he actually had people telling him, hey, you know, just keep in mind it's live television. Make sure that you keep your emotions in check. Then I followed up by saying, because, you know, Connor McDavid looked like someone kicked his dog when he got drafted by Edmonton in 2015. Right. And, and Macklin actually said every single person who gave him advice about how to act in the draft bought that up. And uh, and he said that it was a, quite a unique experience for uh, for Connor. Well, if you had seen, you didn't see the broadcast, so you didn't, you, you, you probably missed in real time all the stuff about him not knowing what Zillow was. I'm I sure saw that. that. I saw that. And uh, yeah, I don't think a 17 year old necessarily should know anything about Zillow. Why? He, he needs to know where he's going to be. I thought that was ridiculous. Anyway, whatever. you thought it was ridiculous that a 17 year old didn't know about a house purchasing app that he's going to have to move. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> like, Come on. <laughs> It's that's like, that's like asking him about his AARP card. Like, oh, please. When I was 17 years old, I don't even think I knew how to buy a house, let alone the. Well, he better learn because he's one. moving to San Jose. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, well, cool. That's a cool experience that you got to do that. Uh, and your coverage and articles and interview with Macklin Celebrini uh, up on ESPN.com right now. Awesome. Uh, that's it for us here on The Drop. Thank you very much for listening. Remember, every Monday and Thursday, wherever you get your audio podcasts as well, NHL on ESPN YouTube. Enjoy the pucks this weekend, and we will catch you on Monday. Bye.